Kung Fu, Jiu Jitsu, Judo, Karate, we can all name a slack handful of different formulations of hand-to-hand -hand combat that we've seen televised at some point or another. There's this fascination that people have with what the human body is capable of and capable of doing harm to one another with no weapons involved. Name a fight scene that blew you away. I'm sure you can. So how do we world build for these arts in a way that makes them feel grounded and cohesive in your setting? Welcome to the Worldcraft Club, a show for writers who want to create rich, immersive settings for their readers to get lost in time and time again. I'm your host, James, coming at you live from the deep and murky depths of Penn's Woods. And I'm joined today by my dear friend and longtime martial arts practitioner, Matt Matias, to discuss some of the mechanics of unarmed combat and how to build out these elements to make your world that much richer. How are you doing, Matt? Yo, what's up? I'm so excited. <laughs> Yeah, man. It's always a treat talking to a podcaster as well. So you got like your studio set up there. You're like ready to go. Yeah, man. I, I mean, know this is my office. I, I yeah. show up to like, you know, <laughs> to tell a marketer to Zoom calls <laughs> like with this and just flex on them for no reason. <laughs> I mean, That's not exactly that I'm doing telemarketer thing. Zoom calls. You know what I mean? I had to yeah, just yeah, pick yeah. something that was like, really. You're just ready. <laughs> you're ready for the mundane. So, yeah, man. Um, Honestly, I, I wanted to just kind of kick off with this question. Why should people listen to you? How long have you been doing martial arts for? And what different forms have you have you practiced over time? Oh, man. I normally discourage people from listening to me. But <laughs> this, in this subject, I feel very yeah. comfortable talking about because I, um, you know, because I, I, I have been a student of martial arts since I was 14. I'm now 38 years old. And um, so I'll just go through the list of things that I've trained for various amounts of time. So uh, when I was 14, I trained judo for about a year. Yeah. Um, so just dabbled in that. Uh, when I was a teenager, I basically just took some regular boxing classes from, there was a guy that was in Lebanon, uh, where I yeah. grew up, Lebanon, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, that uh, was, uh, I believe he was like a world champion uh, boxer of, of some sort, like in the Olympics or something yeah, like that. Yeah, and yeah, he yeah. would just train, he was just in the middle of the, the uh, urban area where he was he was an old dude and he would just train anybody that would show up to his garage that he had it was like all these punching bags around and and so i learned a lot of basic boxing rules from him mm. uh whenever i would show up with some of my friends and um so that was really cool really really ghetto but like he was legit like he had plaques everywhere pictures of him in the news you, oh, you know yeah. the newspapers and stuff like that clippings um, <laughs> clipping yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh once i got to college um, I had a Korean roommate who was uh, Taekwondo. Uh, he was very, like, I, I don't know where he ranked or, or whatever, but he was very, very skilled. And so I, I learned, I knew how to use my hands pretty well, but I didn't know how to use my feet. And yeah. so he taught me a lot of things I didn't know. Um, and it just, and at that point, that's when, like, it really started to pick up for me where I was like, I really want to just learn more. And yeah. so um, I trained some Muay Thai uh, a little bit. And uh, I also started training some Krav Maga in college. I did that for about two oh, semesters. Oh, wild. I didn't yeah, know I that. I trained Krav Maga for two semesters. Yeah. Uh, and that was also pretty pretty ghetto, too. Like, it, it, the guy was legit as well. Um, I, I didn't, like... I, I, f I found out there's a lot of people that train martial arts that are just jokes. That yeah. they just... They just... They have this dojo set up where they have some self-congratulated plaque on the wall that they got from this inner circle of people that are all out of shape you know that are all yeah and i won't yeah, i won't yeah. name any arts or anything like that but <laughs> those are a dime a dozen but this yeah. guy like he he i believe he came from russia he also was like a certified instructor um there was like 30 people that we would train together in uh, a parking lot actually and he was like the reason we trade in a parking lot is because this is the real deal we train this and it was like in the middle of the night almost like it, not in the middle of the night but it was like you know after dinner it was it was in the evening and it was in outdoors. It was very strange, but I learned a lot of really cool basics there as well. Um, so I, I Krav Maga, Muay Thai, Taekwondo, some Judo. And then I, um, at one point, I started training Muay Thai with uh, another guy who was a professional fighter who attended my church, um, who he was a professional Muay Thai fighter. Yeah. Taught me some, taught me some more Muay, Muay Thai as well. Um, and we actually did, we actually hosted a martial arts, um, I guess I don't know how to say it, like a class or of some sort, a study yeah. in church. Yeah, yeah. I was I huh. was an associate minister for a while, and so we had 
uh, one of the guys who who was one of our coaches there, quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we would teach the the kids before youth group. We would teach them Muay Thai and ju- and Jiu Jitsu, um, <laughs> and it was a little weird. But like these guys were legit. The guy, the, yeah, the Jiu Jitsu yeah. guy was a blue belt, and the Muay Thai guy, like I said, he used to be a professional fighter. So he was teaching like actually legit, the actual um, Muay Thai. Muay Thai, yeah. and so and and I would also get like private lessons with him, and he really helped uh, me home my my Muay Thai. Um, then I was like, you know what? I want to actually go to a, like a legit school. I want to like pay for it. And so I enrolled in a uh, Kung Fu uh, studio where I, where I learned white, uh, what is it? Pai Lum White Dragon Fist, which apparently yeah. comes from Hawaii. Um, I'm not, I, I honestly, I'm not sure how legit that is, but yeah, the yeah. training was very, very helpful. I felt very healthy when I trained it. I felt strong very balanced um the guy's wife was also a yoga master the guy the the sifu who was yeah. who ran the gym his wife was a yoga master and so he incorporated yoga into uh the training as well so it was really cool learning breathing exercises kumlun i showed you once the kumlun breathing exercise yeah. and the monks exercise and then i learned a bunch of uh, i guess what would be considered katas and forms and things like that um but that was like you know what this doesn't really feel super effective and so I then signed up for an actual Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu school, and I've been training since then, since uh, 2017. I'm, I'm a purple belt in Jiu Jitsu, and I've been basically growing in my Muay Thai as well. So that's that's my, I guess, resume. Yeah, no, that's rad. You've been around the block. Like that's that's a couple mm. of different arts. Yeah. Like one of, one of the things that kind of like impre- was impressed upon me when 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 you and I had first started talking about this because like i think there's this continual like answer that comes comes back when people talk about like martial arts it's like what are you what in a distilled fashion do you gain from martial arts like if mm. i you know you enter into a situation where you've got an untrained fighter somebody who's just say just a big strong dude who's fighting somebody who's trained what is the difference between these two individuals and the way that they're going to approach that combat i don't want to be like too joe rogany here and and yeah yeah yeah, dude bro it like you know yeah yeah if you don't know it then you're screwed you know i don't want to yeah 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 dude bro it like that but (laughs) there is a reality so um you know i went into let's i'll just put it like this i went into the jujitsu uh gym that i am now part of with all the experience that i had um, and I was like, you know, this is just going to be another thing where I just pick it up and it'll be it'll be fun to just do. Um, and I got smashed, <laughs> like absolutely <laughs> smashed because I really didn't have much grappling experience. And so once yeah. I got into jujitsu, I was like, yeah, I've always wanted to learn grappling uh, and, and wrestling and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I just went in there and just it's another dimension that I entered uh, once once I figured that out. So. Uh, and but then when I would do the Muay Thai classes, I would actually beat up on some of the more weathered, experienced fighters because like I I was more you, you had this with, mix of experience. Yeah, and so they were they actually like promoted me pretty quickly within Muay Thai, but in Jiu Jitsu because it was a, a whole other world. Even with all my experience, I completely like I said just got demolished even yeah. by new people. Um, mm-hmm. And then the the upper belts like the brown belts, black belts, it, they just ragdolled me regardless yeah. of what I did I, and I didn't know what to do there's I was completely and utterly helpless so I don't know if that answers your question but that you know. no I, I I think it does it's it's kind of like you have this edge over people like I think one time we had discussed it and um my, my limited martial arts experience was I once watched the karate kid movie <laughs> not the like original one but the one where like they had the kids go in the little kids and they had like all these different powers and stuff yeah. I thought it was rad and I did this <laughs> kick and I like bashed my head on the ground because I tried to do like a full like I just tried to kick like right up in the air and my body oh, just went with me and I landed on my head like a cartoon and uh, had to go to the hospital uh, it was like it's wow. pretty bad. Uh, so that's my martial arts experience. But like, um, one of the things that I think you, you 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 had said one time when we were discussing this was like martial arts sort of provides this muscle memory mm-hmm. to give you a set of like the ability to react quickly. Because I don't think martial artists like I think the sort of vision that people have of a martial arts practitioner is the world sort of slows down around them and they fight. And I'm sure there's a sense in which like mentally there's there's a different level of focus and I'm, I'll, I'll grant that but i think the real thing that's happening is more like that guy's doing that thing 
I have the training to see that he is currently making cur this maneuver. I see this opening. I make this move from my bag of tricks that answers this weakness. And because I have trained it and practiced with it and sparred with it so long, I yeah. have sort of that muscle memory to be like, this is what I need to do to get out of this. Yeah. Is that a sensible way to sort of distill it down? Yeah. I'm um, sure it misses lots, but like... No, that's actually pr pretty... So when I first started jujitsu, as I mentioned, I was lost. I was just getting destroyed, mm -hmm. um, and it felt like a blur. Just I was on the ground. I wasn't used to being. I wasn't used to being on the ground. I wasn't used to being overpowered in that way. Even though I'm not that big of a dude, but you know, I, I'm pretty squirrely, and I've and I worked at a maximum You're scrappy security guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I worked at a maximum security detention center, and I was able to hold my own with the inmates. You know, that were huge, massive dudes, yeah. um, and so you know, I, I was comfortable being in you know a fight setting, but it, it just. I didn't know what to do. It was like just a blur of emotions and movements. Mm, and mm. I remember my coach saying, he's like, yeah, it is a blur for a while, but once you get used to it and you get used to the positions that you're in, um, it, it starts to slow down and starts to be clear as day. And you that's what it, math. yeah. And that's what happens. Like what, uh, what happens is, um, there are different sets or positions that you, become familiar with so you know your next move if you can or you can strategize how to get to that position um you can then move on to submissions they say in in jujitsu it's position over submission so a lot of people they want to they think they if once you start jujitsu you just lock something in put that rear naked choke in and that's it but the, what enables that submission is actually being in a prime position to do so so mm -hmm. and to get to that position you need to know what to get past you have to you have to get back to past the legs you have to get under the arm you have to do something to get to that position so you so you can secure that submission um and also you know if you don't get that submission what do you do you have you have to have like a, uh you have to be familiar and comfortable with what rules you can play by uh to do something else so there's lots of different movements and sets and positions uh and you know with jujitsu it's so complex. Um, I, like I tell you all the time, like boxing, I felt was like chess or, or checkers. Um, Muay Thai is like chess, and then jujitsu or grappling is like quantum physics. It's just the, yeah, <laughs> the it's level just, just of level. advancement is just out of control in comparison. I think. Yeah. So so Stash, uh, who's commenting backstage here as a member of the the Discord server, was okay. talking about doing uh, doing pistol drills and saying that there is mm. weird things that can happen with your perception. And I think just with lots and lots of practice and sort of a bit of adrenaline thrown in, where he he could actually see the slide going back and the muzzle flash on the gun, says that's that is not doesn't normally happen it's kind of like your brain sort of slow mowing things um which is it, it's interesting and i think i think fighting really does that because it's this combination of y y it is overcoming a lot of animal instincts yeah because like i can tell you i would not f be a good fighter at least not without a lot of training because like I, I just, I, I, I kind of see red and I'm uncoordinated and I'm mm. not like, I'm not, I'm not very physically agile or capable of kind of holding my own in that situation. I, I, I get it. I respect it. But, um, what, what I think is interesting about this, and this is just laying the groundwork really for if you're, if you're going into a setting, considering world building, these are some basic building blocks that we're yeah. kind of talking about here. The way that fights are perceived and the sorts of challenges that whatever martial art you create has to overcome. And so like what I kind of want to talk about in some ways is um, what you think are... If, if somebody is coming up, let's say they're just building a fantasy setting, they've got a certain like, you know, a, a species in there like elves or something like that. And they're building mm -hmm. a martial art to like support that that, that race can carry out, right? Um, in certain types of combat, let's say like in the mines against orcs or something. And, that, and they're mm -hmm. trying to build this out. What are the initial building blocks that you might include if you were going to just say, hey, it's going to need the following things. And I know it's going to mm -hmm. be situational, but before we kind of apply that situational logic on it, what are some things that you have found in your experience with different martial arts that they all had in common yeah. that someone would have to write out if they were going to make it feel nice and grounded? So, yeah, the they one way that I've heard best 
that that describes that best describes martial arts mm. is basically they all apply they all adhere to uh rock paper scissors you know the game of mm. rock paper scissors where you know paper beats rock uh scissors beats paper and it's just this endless loop where one thing beats the other but the other thing beats that thing and um that's a lot how martial arts that's very much how martial arts is in general mm. as a whole yeah. um and you can see this in uh so f- boxing for example so uh if i throw a jab i can cover my chin uh if i throw a right jab i can cover my chin and in that way do offense and d- defense at the same time however like even if i have my other hand up protecting my my chin completely i can still be open for an uppercut or a body shot yeah and so if that and then and in return if that person does an uppercut they're completely open with their you know their chin is completely open and so um whenever you throw an attack of any type you always have an opening somewhere else no matter Mm -hmm. how well guarded or how experienced you are and the experienced martial artist knows how to plan ahead and and know like anticipate or feign what their attacks is going to be. So anticipate their opponent and then feign what their attack's going to be. And so in that way, it becomes very much a mental game, a very cerebral game. So where some guy, um, let's say that some guy's throwing lots and lots of kicks in the same exact spot. Like he's just throwing a body kick to the mm-hmm. ribs, body mm-hmm. kick to the ribs, body kick to the ribs. You're gonna, ex- you're naturally gonna expect another body kick to the ribs. But there's a there's a kick, there's a kick called the question mark kick where it looks and it feels like it's going to go to your body, but you switch your hip around and your your um, shin from your knee comes around the shoulder and goes to the chin. And so, you know, and, and, and if you can get your opponent to flinch and protect that body, then their chin's going to be open. And so in that way, you know, you can play that uh, that head game. So in, yeah. in developing any type of martial art, uh, whether it be, you know, in, in story, you want to make sure that there's a system in place. If this person does this, they are open to this. If this person does that, they have to have an opening here. Um, it's in a, in a lot of ways, it's very boring to read something that's impenetrable, you know, like, yeah. a, like an impenetrable, like that's why there's a lot of complaints about Superman It's like, Oh, well he's invulnerable. Like, okay, you no matter what you do to him, there's nothing that's, there's nothing's really going to affect him, but a, a really good, system a power system if you if you will yeah. um shows that there's weaknesses whenever there's some whenever there's some type of attack so i was able actually to p- compile a couple movies that i think are really good examples oh, of this sweet thank you um so chinese chess boxing um is one of my favorites it's a kung fu movie that it talks about it's from the 70s but it is a a classic kung fu movie where a a uh, young man learns uh, kung fu to avenge uh, you know the death of a family member of some sort, but he has to yeah. learn this this system from a wise master, uh, and they call it the ch- uh, chess boxing because the master uses uh, certain Chinese chess moves to fight against other people's forms, and so mm. they'll call out these moves like just so you understand what they're doing, and it's really kind of corny if you watch it now but i yeah. love it because it's like i'm using broken wood against you know or wood shatters steel or steel gets get gold but you know you get the gist of it where if somebody's doing one move it's strong against uh, a certain defense hmm. or, or it's strong against a certain opening and or a certain type of defense is weak against another type of attack um so that's one i think it's one of the best examples of it uh, if you like kung fu movies yeah um in anime, there's a there's a show called Hunter X Hunter that is an extremely advanced, one of the best power scaling systems ever, in my opinion. Um, how it uses Nen and Aura, and how you can mix those things together uh, within and, and basically in unique ways to each character. Um, really, really advanced and well done um, mechanics that they put together. Um, Last one, and then I'll let you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Um, there's a there's a movie with um, our our dude Christian Bale that's a sleeper. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Equilibrium. Oh, um, the gun kata. Yes, the gun kata <laughs> is so good. It's so yeah. unique, and it's so amazing. 
there, I mean, there's not too much of a system there where it's like, if I do this, I do this. It's kind of just like, if I know Gunkata and I'm better than you, then I win. But it's it's unique in the sense that it's it's a specially developed martial art against other gunfire. It's it's C, it's CQC like essentially gunplay with dual, yeah. dual wheel. like it's supposed to be like really like nice and close up or to clear a room right yeah it's a, it's a it's it's like somewhere between math and kung fu because it was like certain yes. geometric positions in order exactly. to make sure everyone gets shot you know it's so dude good. yeah that that movie was flipping way better than i think it got credit for it was dismissed as a matrix clone it came out at the wrong dude. time but it, it's yeah. not it's it was it was a really cool concept yeah that's yeah also sean bean in it dies oh, again dies again yeah. uh because <laughs> that's what sean bean that's what he do yeah, imagine what... if we spent the money to rescue sean bean that we wasted rescuing oh. matt damon can you imagine how many more sean beans we'd have um <laughs> No, no, that's that's good actually. Uh, so, so Stash wrote in the in the backstage here. Princess Bride has a really neat fence sort of fencing scene yes, in it, and like yes. it's fun. But like, I even think about Ahsoka. Um, if you watch mm. uh, the scene where she fights uh, Balin Skull, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's this. There is like a full. I, I loved it because they lingered, but it was like mm -hmm. thirty seconds of them just changing their footwork and and yeah. getting like they 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 just sort of change forms and you can watch it and they do this a lot in in I think high quality movies with like solid fights in them. You'll watch these guys stare each other down and go, okay, he's about to do this. What am I gonna do? You know, they're mm -hmm. about to do that. What am I gonna do? Um, and I like this idea of thinking about martial arts in terms of action and then counter. Like, yes. how do you, like, if somebody comes in doing such and such, how I then counter it? So there's a really good uh, little uh, comic somebody had drawn that was about dwarven fighting techniques because they're short, mm -hmm. right? But they're really stocky and they're very strong. So it was about them sort of, like, using shield tactics to sort of, like, one guy would lower down and the other one would jump off the other guy's shoulders basically to get, like, a stab mm -hmm. in. And it was, like... It was neat because it was kind of like showing how these different combat forms would work. And it's honestly partly inspired like my desire to do this episode more about hand-to-hand mm. -hand combat than like weapons. But it's it's kind of fascinating. I, I, I think that's really where you have to begin. You have to look at what the character is facing mm -hmm. and look at the challenges that they're facing and then consider how they would build techniques that can maximize their strengths and exploit their opponent's weaknesses right mm -hmm. that's really cool and i think that's where where you'd want to begin with that and so i i this is this is kind of comes to like sort of the second segment of the episode that i wanted to kind of go into and this is this is just going to get silly i imagine but like <laughs> one of the things we talked about on the server is the challenges of different biologies different species fighting each other right mm. so you've got halflings just real scrappy little guys right you've got your like you've got elves all these fantasy races if you go into like sort of sci-fi dimensions you've got like i don't know if you ever saw that movie jupiter ascending oh my goodness um, <laughs> it's a terrible yes. it's it's horrible well it's it's a terrible movie with a really cool world right? yeah like and it's what it, it. it's like it was so neat just the big flick flipping winged dinosaur man fighting the dude yeah. with the magic skate shoes is like it is really rad and like yeah. you know but you think about situations like that where in fantasy settings you've got creatures with radically different biologies fighting each other mm -hmm. right so you might have like a dude with a scorpion tail or like you know mortal Kombat four arms or whatever and um i guess what i want to kind of do is throw some suppose ifs at you and just sort of ask what the counters would be. And this is sort of to give a writer some food for thought if they're kind of like, because I'm hearing the the counter uh, and the kind of rock, paper, scissors. And I'd love yeah. to just, are you, would you be game to give that a shot if I just yeah. started pitching the name? Sounds fun. All right. So we definitely have uh, folks in the backstage as well who might throw some ideas in there. But my, my first thing is you've got a radical height difference between you and your opponent. You've got like a halfling mm -hmm. versus a goliath. So like somebody who's like, you know, three and a half, four feet high compared with like Andre the Giant, you know, sort mm -hmm. of like size difference. You're the little guy. Yep. You're stuck in a fight situation. I, I know that like I think the conventional logic with with uh martial arts would be 
do not involve yourself in such a fight because it's yeah. like it's just not gonna it's not likely to go in your favor and I, right. I feel like half of martial arts is restraint but in this instance you're, you're forced in a situation where you must fight how do you maximize advantage when you've got that significant height difference um so this is perfect for me because i'm normally the shortest guy in my gym <laughs> um but like um a good way to to focus on um beating a larger opponent is you know go for the feet <laughs> honestly <laughs> that's like the, the that's the the big rule um because as a, as a general rule um a lot of martial arts is disrupting the other person's base yeah um in in any way shape or form that's possible so for mm -hmm. instance when you throw a jab um i'm trying to get you to either stand your ground or back up yeah um, and and you know when i fake a jab i'm trying to get you to either move and and, and doing some head movement can sometimes disrupt your base as well but just you know throwing a jab out can do that um yeah and then if i get your base disrupted uh, when you're coming back into to settle into your base to throw a punch that's when i can use my timing to you know do, do something else i like go for the body or go some uh just dis disrupt you in another way and this is extremely applicable in, in uh, grappling so in judo um a lot of the movements are just holding on to the lapels or the clothing of the person that you're fighting um and it's basically a battle of who can get their hips under the other person's hips faster or more technically yeah. um so with judo a very small person a child can throw somebody who's 400 pounds if they're able to get the mechanics down leverage of, yeah basically levering leveraging their hips underneath uh something so that they can topple that person over them um or get that person's legs to get higher than their hips in some way shape or form and if with pop proper leverage like anyone can um no matter how they're what their size they can get somebody now this is this gets weird when you get into fantasy like obviously a hobbit is not going to topple uh, a cave troll you know <laughs> yeah, just not yeah, gonna yeah, happen. yeah it's but, just don't go hand to hand with a cave troll like that's yeah the, and then that's the advice <laughs> and then there's also genetic freaks of humans that it's just like you're just not gonna do something to yeah, any of them yeah. to that person uh they do exist and yeah. so you know i would i would say but for the most part um, most humans can do that to other humans. Now, if you're talking about other species, it does get weird. So, like, I, I mean, we, you and I were talking, like, an octopus. Like, say an octopus. <laughs> it's, like, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. not going to work because they're ba I'm imagining an octopus just being seated on the ground and having all these tentacles just waving all over the place. You're not going to, you know, be able to fight that thing <laughs> and, and get rid of its base because that's its base. It's who is what it is. It's basically like a tree. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. A jello tree. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question at all. No, no, I, <laughs> I think it does. Like it, in some ways I think about reach as well yes. and trying to get, mm -hmm. trying to get in close. And I think you, you, you were leaning into the, like the grappling and the throws there. And I yeah. feel like that's kind of interesting because you would then imagine that a, a shorter race, like a shorter species, like halflings would probably have a martial art that focused on making the most of their short stature and kind mm -hmm. of getting in nice and close and probably doing more like those sorts of grapples and throws and off balancing mm -hmm. and distraction and probably heavy use of pocket sand um, <laughs> to like really turn the battle in their favor. Uh, so here's, I, I, so so yeah, I think, I think that works. I think that gives you sort of a vision for like, you've mm -hmm. got this race of diminutive critters. They're probably going to be using that, you know? So these also might work for like kobolds or goblins or something like that um so a, another one to throw at you then is you're fighting something that has innate weaponry right mm. so you've got a lizard folk or dragon folk that have you know they might have claws they may have they may have some scale armor that makes striking like a little bit trickier so mm -hmm. what would be kind of a way to think about that? We could throw tails and wings in there as well, but I feel like let's just <laughs> just mm. segment it to a couple of things at a time. Oh, what do you think with that? Oh, man. <laughs> this is tough. <laughs> um, yeah, I would need to know, like, what what's available to the, to the um, protagonist, like what they're, how they're yeah. able to attack, yeah. what their limitations are. It's true. Um, it's true. The armor, yeah, when you th start throwing armor in there, I, th I start thinking about, like, video games. 
Yeah. Um, I like this fighting game called Tekken. And there's yeah. a move you can do that, that they're called armor moves. They just introduced this. Mm. Um, I've been playing Tekken since like, I've been playing it for like 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. And, um, th- you know, just in the past few years, in the past few games, they've introduced this armor move where uh, if somebody's just spamming moves, you can do this armor move and you just absorb all the punches coming in and you do your, an attack of your own. Um, there's ways t- that you can fight around that where it's like, you you have to just anticipate that they're going to do that move, um, and yeah. So if somebody is armored and they're and they're very durable, I guess I'll try and make yeah. this as applicable yeah, yeah, to yeah. real life as possible. If somebody is just you just know if you punch they them can in just the face, tank it. yeah, they'll just tank it. They're just super durable. Um, there's always certain ways you can overpower them, and and there's always weaknesses. Like like I said, the feet are usually the weakest part of somebody's uh, body. Um, so going for what's called like a low single is what you'll see somebody like a wrestler do where they dive literally for the ankle or like do an ankle pick where they'll grab the ankle, they'll put the hand on the shoulder and just pull and that disrupts the the base instantly. Uh, even if somebody's huge and strong, they'll it'll make them get off their base and you can do some more follow-up attacks. So getting somebody on the ground is, you know, where, is where more jujitsu will come into play. Um, so if somebody, if something has armor, you just want to get it off its feet. You know, if it's like a standing soldier, if it's like a tank or something like that, I don't know what the heck to tell you, dude, but if it's, oh, yeah, like yeah, arm- yeah, yeah. If it's an armored being like with a huge weapon, um, I would just try and get them off their base. That's honestly yeah. like yeah, one it's, of the it's, biggest it's, funda- Yeah. It's, it's, I was it just going like to say, it comes it's, back to that. Yeah. I was just going to say it's one of the fundamental rules of battle. Just get the person off their base. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think I think this may wind up being like the recurring theme in a lot of yeah. ways. Like it's it comes down to like you're just trying to get that sucker on the ground. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's stop them from having the advantages that they have. Um I, I, I think that the, the claws thing is interesting as well. And I think you're stuck mm-hmm. with that just kind of trying to keep their arms out of play as much as you can. Okay. Yeah. And so if we're going to go to the counter system too, like say yeah. that the protagonist does have like strong punches or, or yeah, does yeah. have some like, sort of power. Yeah. If they're proficient with some type of weapon, you know, a staff, uh, a spear of some sort, um, if they can anticipate or cause their opponent to throw an attack, they are then open to an attack. Uh, yeah. So that it's kind of like that counter system where, you know, you'll see in sometimes in movies where it's like, Hey, I'm over here. And then they'll jump out of the way and then they will do something else. Like where either they'll run away or they'll, they'll hit them. Uh, in boxing, there's this thing called stick and move where, you know, you throw a punch, then you get out of the way. And that causes the person to, when they're throwing a punch back to be off balance and be open for another, uh, consecutive hit. I've seen and Tyson so, do that. Oh like, yeah. Like that dude is scrappy. Yeah, Tyson, sorry, oh my goodness. just so fast. It's unreal. Yeah. For so like a, Tyson's yeah. system, one of the reasons he became so powerful is because the system that he incorporated, the peekaboo system, was just so rare uh, and so, like, it was just so unorthodox, the way that he incorporated a system where he was just always moving and really, really tight. And, and Mike Tyson was just a, a smaller heavyweight. But because he was able to, like, be super quick and generate extremely explosive power. He was able to just be one of the greatest heavyweights of all time um, mm. through that peekaboo system because um, he would be moving his head. People were trying to knock his head, and it was such a prof- efficient system that he was able to dodge and block and move it, like at, at all times, and so he had very few openings. Yeah. Um, and, and so it was just he was a problem for everybody. Um so yeah, I don't know if that answers your armor question. And no, no, that's- no. That's that's good. That's good. I, I think it kind of, in a lot of ways, it's it, it, one of the problems that we kind of run into is we're really talking when we talk about this about it. it, it, it you, I, I think you you're right to bring it down to what advantages does the protagonist have, right? Mm-hmm. What advantages does your character have? What advantage does this species have that you're working with? Yeah. And I think that's where it has to come back to because part of it is just like when your opponent has an advantage over you, the goal is, it seems, deny them that advantage if you can help it. 
Yeah. If you can't help it, get them off balance, like, and get them on the ground as quick as you can. It's again, it's, mm-hmm. it's that denial and being aware of the potential weaknesses and sort of chinks in the armor and things like that, that you can, you can exploit. And so that's, that's kind of the real challenge is it's like a rock, paper, scissors thing. And I think a good question anybody doing world building has is like, you're building an underdog. Sure. What advantage do they have? Are mm. they incredibly quick? Can they, can they just Mike Tyson it out to the point where they can be distracting and off putting, throw people off their balance and like, you know, get their punches in when they can, like, how's that going to work? So yeah. I think, I, I think that's a lot of good food for thought. And I think as people create their own settings, they're going to want to dive into this question of rock, paper, scissors. What are they fighting against? I think one question, an interesting one is environment, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got uh, the the elves fighting the goblins under the mountains or the dwarves fighting the goblins under the mountains. You've got limited space to move in, like cramped conditions. Is there anything different from sort of an environmental perspective? Like... Or if your opponent has the high ground and you're on a lava planet, like, <laughs> you know, like, so an example would yeah. be like a cramped setting, like a tunnel. Would there be, do you think there might be a dwarven martial art approach that would be different? And how would you, how would you kind of game that out? Yeah. I mean, in, it would, like a, a cramp, a cramped setting would be advantageous for the dwarf, in my opinion, because they're mm-hmm. short, advantage, very, dwarf. very, very low center of gravity. Uh, whereas if you have some huge colossal giant Goliath type dude, then um, have yeah, that he's mobility. he's yeah he's gonna get swarmed by the dwarves or he's gonna get beaten up uh, by a dwarf with an axe pretty easily. Um, yeah, I guess going back to the whole rock paper scissors thing. So if you have an environment that lends itself to you that you know you you obviously are able to overtake opponents that you wouldn't be able to in other areas. Um, I'm trying to think of some more environmental stuff. So, like, for instance, like, my skill is I'm fast and I'm technical. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of strong. But there's other guys at my gym that are just absolutely terrifyingly yeah. strong, like, inhumanly strong, where they just <laughs> grab you and you're like, strength. yeah, I'm going for a ride. Like, if they grab you, it's <laughs> over. I'm going to go flying. Um, but I've learned how to tolerate some of that stuff to the best of my ability yeah. where I use my speed to keep them out of um you know out of out of reach in some way. So in that way like say that if you, if your protagonist is the giant in that closed environment um you know you know you're at a disadvantage. So what are your advantages? Um the advantage would be you know that he could maybe ball up and use his muscles to be very very durable um or he could maybe uh, use his strength to like break break apart the rocks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like create some more space for himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, where you know my advantages in in the mats are I'm I'm fast, I'm technical, um, and I have a lot of energy. Um, somebody who's super strong. Uh, I've learned that if I can just get them moving and chasing after me, they can, they'll gas out faster most of the time, and that's yeah. when I can have my way with them where you know they're they're in my world (laughs) you're in my world now so you know using understanding your limits and understanding the limits of your character and and seeing what you can do to have them cognizant of how they can use that in environments you know hey you know say if you're your your huge goliath protagonist is in a world that is very hot and steamy like they're they know that their stamina is going to be completely depleted very very quickly and so they'll know to conserve their energy and they'll know that they need to be aware of things so like the, that they might soak some hits in order to mm-hmm. look for a point of advantage and then yeah. seize it when they get it because they know if they can land that one punch they got it but they're going to look like they're losing early mm-hmm. yeah. yeah that's good i like that yeah and, i think uh, that's yeah go for it you said you weren't going to do wings stuff. <laughs> did you want to throw wings in there? Like, did, did you I'm, have a thought on wings? I'm t- I'm trying to see. I don't mean, I don't know. <laughs> it does get weird. Um, because yeah, if you're, if you're like, the, <laughs> if they're the, freaking the, flying, like you've yeah. got other problems. Like it's just, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, it would be get in the closed, enclosed space, right? Like, like mm-hmm. take their advantage, take their, exactly. Advantage take the them to an environment where they, you know, you have the advantage or, uh, look for openings, create openings. Creating openings is also 
the battle. You know, get, getting somebody off their off their base is is the main goal. Um, so to create the opportunity to attack. However, you still need to create opportunities to get them off their base. So in yeah. the in the flying scenario, if there's a flying pterodactyl that's coming for a dwarf or something like that, the dwarf's yeah. gonna find a place to hide. He's gonna maybe, tr- you know, throw out, throw out a decoy to cause the pterodactyl to go after that decoy and so maybe he can jump on top of it or maybe he can create yeah. an opening so that he can you know suplex smash it, with it. His, yeah suplex it, smash it with the hammer or or axe or something like that um like that. creating opportunities is a lot of what martial arts is and, and just that just, situational awareness yes yeah. and having that sort of practice of being in high stress environments and it's a uh, stash again in, in the backstage here made this really good point here it's is is mm that we're kind of sort of dancing around here in some ways, which is the point of the fight, right? So mm-hmm. one, one of the things that um, that I think we discussed at the beginning, we sort of were like, there's no way out, right? Like you've got it, you're, you're stuck. You have to you have to fight the individual. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reality is though, if your goal is just, you know, like bleep, survive, like that's the, that's, that's a different story. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're looking for a way to escape and that might involve having that situa- situational awareness of, of your surroundings to position them such that you can make your escape. Yeah. You know, if it is to stall them long enough to distract them for some reason, like that could again be it. And coming down to that goal of the fight, you're also going to have awareness of your character's abilities. So like, for example, if you got a scrappy little guy like yourself and you're try you're trying to keep the fight going, you're going to use that scrappy little guy energy and you're going to be throwing jabs at him, you're going to be getting him kind of, you know, you're, you're going to be trying to distract him and keep him moving. Um but then if you're a big guy, you're going to be turtling up and you're going to yeah. be wanting to conserve your energy and you're going to want to last as long as you can so you're not going to push it, you know? And your your goal of the fight and thinking about where that's going is going to be really, really critical to how you game it out. And yeah. it's, again, that that objectives thing. And then you have, like, sort of the narrative objective of the fight. And it's like, um, I, I don't know if you know this, but, like, Scott Pilgrim, right, uh, versus the world, uh, mm. that that movie, the way it was designed is it closely followed a musical where each of the fights actually, like, were were sort of different songs you might find in a musical like the fight with Matthew Patel was the I want song that usually appears at the beginning of every musical where you know the protagonist goes like I live in this small provincial town but there must be more in the world beyond kind of thing and like so each of the fights actually kind of is supposed to follow the standard rhythm of a musical so each of the fights had a narrative purpose the character had an internal goal and then there was the practicalities of, of the fight itself. Mm-hmm. And so considering those three layers is kind of like, it's an interesting thing. And then you, you add that sort of martial arts knowledge into this. Again, big guy wants to conserve energy. Little guy's going to be more like scrappy and quick mm-hmm. on their feet. And then if you bring in the different species elements to it, the training they're going to have is going to be a rock, paper, scissors sort of, um, sort of scenario where basically it's... Um, you know, you're going to be looking at different different species utilizing the gifts God gave them, you know, <laughs> to, yeah. to, to fight well. So you got the dwarf is going to be scrappy. I think a dwarf would make a great grappler because they're going to want to close in and get rid of that, like, that range advantage that everybody else has with the reach. And they're going to want to close in and, and put someone off their base. They're very hard to throw off their base. So I feel like dwarven wrestlers make sense. You know, actually, yeah. pretty much all your short guys wind up being wrestlers so they can get past the defenses right but it's it's kind of fascinating to throw all those things into the mix when you're creating it and i think this might just be a good place for us to us to close out um any final thoughts or words or things people can reference yeah um i think a good world has a good system and a good system allows for advantages and disadvantages uh and creating those opportunities for either you know your your protagonist to be disadvantaged or your opponent to be disadvantaged um and i, I think that's really the core uh of what you should be looking for in the worlds that you're writing all right matt has left the studio and it's just me here a few days later poor guy i told him he would only be here for 25 minutes max and i had up like 45 minutes honestly it's just that there was some great stuff here that you can take away from this discussion 
I think the rock, paper, scissors element is one of the things that's the most useful. It really ties into what Steel Stash was getting at in the backstage. A martial art is often organically developed as a systematized answer to a long-standing problem. You've got large, dominant lizard folks in the dwarven tunnels. Suddenly, you need the ability to fight larger opponents with clawed hands, and your methods change to accommodate. To build tension in conflicts between martial arts, remember that every move has a counter. And throwing a dominant character in an unfamiliar setting can cause a ton of disruption, despite their otherwise overwhelming skill. Martial arts is a fertile ground with tons of opportunity to develop dramatic tension and uncertainty. One thing I think we didn't cover here was more of the historical context and traditions surrounding martial arts, how real-world examples came to be. I think there's some real gold here for future episodes, but as always, let us know in the comments if there's something we missed or can go over in greater depth in another time. In case you want more Matt, and why wouldn't you? He's a Christian content creator and hosts the Meme Lord Monday podcast, which is linked in the show notes. He'd love to see you there. Additionally, if you'd like to be backstage in any one of these interviews and wax lyrical with us, there's always room for you in the Discord server in the show notes. It's a blast there, and we're always doing stuff. Anyways, for Matt, I'm James, and this has been another episode of the Worldcraft Club podcast. Thanks so much for joining us.